Good day, Neil. Thanks again for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Zoom. Uh, I, we've been connected online and social media for not that long, but uh, I, you post some very interesting things and you seem to be an evidence-based practices kind of guy. I don't know if that's your language or not, but uh, so that's why I was interested in, in bringing you into this series to talk a little bit about uh, what I call human performance technology. But for our audience, could you please introduce yourself and let's start off with where did you grow up? Yeah, so um, yeah, my name is Neil Mosley. I'm currently a independent digital learning consultant and designer. Um, and I grew up in a, in a city called Bradford, which is in the north of England. Um, it's kind of a big post-industrial town. Um, so yes, yeah, spent uh, my formative years there. So where did you go to school and what did you study? Yeah, this is a, this is always an interesting one uh, in respect to what I do now. So I, I actually um, <clears throat> studied in a city called Leeds, which is um, very close to Bradford. And I studied at um, Leeds Conservatoire. So I actually studied at a music college. So my background is in music and I studied jazz. Um, and I think that probably it's probably a good link with your intro music guy, I think. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, my background is in music, really, and that's why that's what I, I studied at, at undergraduate. So, how did you get? So, so let, let's cover it now. So, uh, you, where do you live now, and where and uh, what do you do uh, specifically? I know you work with universities, but tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, so um, I I live in a city called Cardiff, um, which is capital city of Wales. Um, so I've moved around a little bit in the UK, but we're in um, Cardiff at the moment. Um, and in terms of what I do at the moment, like I said at the top, so I'm, I'm kind of independent consultant designer. So um, I, we'll, we'll maybe get to this, but my background is primarily in sort of higher education and with universities. But now um, as an independent, uh, I, I continue to work with universities, but I also work with um, sort of schools and training providers. So there's a bit more diversity in terms of the type of education provider that I work with at the moment. Um, and that can involve a number of different things. So online education is a big passion of mine. And so, you know, the design of <clears throat> online courses and programs is something that I do equally supporting um, those that teach or are new to teaching online is, is an aspect of it. And I guess, um, you know, one of the big things at the moment for a lot of education providers, um, particularly who maybe are coming from a more traditional kind of model um, you know, the, the, the term there is kind of digital transformation. A lot of organizations are um, really seriously looking at how they start to use digital technology a little bit more seriously in what they, what they do. And that might mean moving from a classroom model to kind of more of a blended or an online. Um, so I help um, education providers with that as well. So let's cover the gap or the, the years between getting a, a degree in music and jazz. And what was your career progression? Can you talk to us a little bit about the kinds of jobs that you had? What I'd like to do is I'd like to share with our audience, you know, how do people get to where they are now? And then we'll get into a little bit later, you know, some of the, the things that you've done. But can you share with us some of the, the, the jobs that you've had and maybe some of the more interesting projects that, that relate to learning and development in, in the education world? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's always a funny one, isn't it? I think um, for uh, a lot of people that I know that kind of do similar roles to me, I think they will say that, um, you know, they didn't necessarily come in and do an, an undergraduate degree in the subject, they kind of found their way um, into doing what they're doing. And that's certainly the case for me. So I've kind of been fortunate to do a number of different things. Actually, um, I um, studying came a little bit later for me. So I wasn't um, uh, it's probably a, a few years later than, and than what's typical in terms of doing my degree. So I worked a little bit in financial services and music industry before studying, um, which was kind of interesting to, to, to see kind of different sectors. And following my degree, um, I was a professional musician for a time. Um, and then through kind of a few different steps, kind of eventually found my way into higher education. So one of the roles that I did before um, getting into higher education is I ran a, a kind of charitable educational trust for a engineering um, professional body. 
And so that gave me a little bit of an exposure to education and um, that trust kind of involved working with universities, but also working with <clears throat> large engineering companies as well. So although it wasn't really um, directly about education and training in terms of what I did. It gave me a little bit of exposure to that side of things. And so from there, I um, moved to Imperial College in London. So I was living in London at the time, spent a number of years there and moved across to Imperial um, initially in a, a kind of a program management role. So really putting um, putting to use all of the skills that I've kind of gained um, in running the trust, but on more of the administrative side in a university. Um, and, you know, I, I think I was pretty fortunate in terms of where I ended up, actually, because I very quickly moved into kind of digital and online education. Um, and, um, you know, the, the environment that I was working in, um, I think I didn't really appreciate this at the time, but was kind of pretty unique for UK higher education. So I, I was working in Imperial College's business school. Um, and I guess I joined at a time where they'd been pushing um, and growing online education for quite a while. Um, and they had um, invested in a team there of designers, of developers, technologists, media specialists, you know, really a kind of studio type setup for, for I guess, supporting, you know, the learning technology component of um, on-campus programs, but also really growing and expanding what they were doing in online education um, and doing that via their own bespoke platform. So there was lots of kind of unique components um, of that um, context, really, that um, now I know so much more about, particularly UK higher education, was pretty unique. Um, so that was really formative for me and uh, really kind of set me on, on the road a little bit. Um, and I can talk a little bit about some of the work there um, as, as well, if, you, if you'd like, Guy. Or no, please think. go ahead. Yeah. So, I mean, um, I think for me, some of the really great things that we were doing there were in online education. So I think... Um, was really fortunate to work on an online MBA, which was a big flagship program for um, <clears throat> for the team and for the school. And, you know, that was a fantastic experience because again, one of the really nice things about that context is that you're working on um, the development of a really great program, um, but you're also, you're also in control of your technology and your platform. So um, you don't often get that, you know, in higher education, a lot of universities will have off-the-shelf products and you kind of can be constrained a little bit by them but working in a, that kind of environment where you can not only design um, you know online courses and programs but actually you can shape the technology that um, supports that as well was, was, was fantastic and to develop that and to push that alongside what we were doing was great. Um, <clears throat> also kind of you know that was my first um, um, kind of deep dive into into MOOCs. So Imperial were one of the first UK universities to get into that. And so I did quite a lot of work um, on a, a suite of MOOCs through edX at the time. Um, and again, that was a really interesting experience. Um, MOOCs are one of those slightly controversial things in, in higher education. But for me, you know, it was a really good experience and exposure into that kind of world. Um, and I just learned so much, I, I suppose, there because you learn about kind of design, you learn about the technology, you learn about the experience and user experience and media and the workflow and how an operation like that works. So, you know, I was really, I was really fortunate. And I think, you know, that experience for me uh, really kind of uh, lit the flame, I suppose. What I read on your one of your websites or a website uh, it was some commentary about MOOCs and how yours was, you know, a, a fabulous experience and all that. Can you talk a little bit about uh, your approach or thoughts about MOOCs versus maybe how most people are doing them and perhaps not doing them so well? Yeah, uh, I mean, I think there's a few things to say about um, MOOCs. I mean, I think, I think often the the, the kind of the discourse around MOOCs is, um, I think is sort of sometimes a little bit unfair because it's, it's, it's comparing sort of MOOCs with 
um, an online course that you sign up for, that you pay for, um, that you're in much smaller cohort for. And I think, you know, you have to, um, if you're gonna engage with MOOCs, you have to kind of do that on their merits and you have to understand that. And I think whilst, you know, uh, you know, they're not above criticism, I think that's the first premise for me to understand what they're about. And I think one of the challenges on that, it, it often comes back to kind of institutional approaches that they often don't really know why they're delving into that world other than kind of being prodded by the hype. Um, so I think for, for me, it, it, that is what you need to understand and that's what needs to govern your expectations a little bit. Um, I think, uh, I think I do see a lot of MOOCs that are quite hurried and rushed out, uh, that not, don't necessarily have a great deal of thought and that probably fall into the trap that we can all fall into in online education where there's a lot of content um, and not much uh, sort of cognitive stretch there really, not much challenge. Um, so I think there's a balance to be had between um, this is a medium that maybe is a little bit more around convenience and a bit more disposable, but that doesn't mean that the kind of learning and the way that you design it and the rigor and the detail uh, needs to be sacrificed. I think that's my general thoughts on, on MOOCs. Thank you. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your first expo? You seem to be kind of an evidence-based practices kind of guy, as I said, and uh, um, I see you, you know, quoting the research and and making suggestions. And so, again, I was intrigued by that. But uh, so I call this thing, as I learned about it, uh, evidence-based practices for performance improvement uh, or HPT, human performance technology. Sometimes it's called HPI, human performance improvement. But it's really all about the science uh, behind that and uh, what used to be called research-based and now is evidence-based. But uh, what was your first, first exposure to that? How did you come to that kind of a mindset? Yeah, good question. I think, well, I, I guess there's two answers there for me. I mean, I think the first thing is that I think, I think just my general disposition is to be fairly analytical. And so, you know, I would class myself as a designer and, and, and I guess what I'd where, where I come from as a designer is if I'm making design choices, then I, I want to make sure that I can uh, justify those design choices. So that's just really my general disposition um, in terms of um, having a basis for a decision and, and being a little bit analytical. I'd say probably first exposure um, to, to those kind of things would probably th be, be through Richard Mayer. Um, and, uh, you know, his book with Ruth Clark, e-learning and the science of instruction, um, was a really useful, um, uh, resource and book for me early on. Um, I think it's obviously a really well-known text, um, in, in online and e-learning. Um, and so you read that to glean wisdom, but then you enter into this whole world of evidence-based practice. So that was, you know, a very important thing for me. And also just connecting with people as well who are more experienced than I uh, than I was at the time and hearing what they had to say and their influences. I, I'm the sort of person, as you said, I'm kind of I'm pretty active on social media, but you know, that's a great means for me to connect and get to know people and to learn from them ultimately. Thank you. So you, you, you've mentioned the uh, Clark and, and Mayer book. Can to help our audience uh, uh, with uh, some resources that they might want to follow up on, are there any other books or articles or other people in, in general that you would suggest uh, that others might follow up with if they're interested in learning a little bit more about this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, another really, really great paper um, from Richard Mayer and from uh, Roxana Moreno as well was... Uh, nine ways to reduce cognitive load in multimedia learning. That's another good one, um, you know, just picking, carrying on on the Richard Mayer theme. I think in terms of, um, you know, other people and other influences, um, I, I really get a lot from Paul Kirshner 
in particular. Um, so, um, you know, he's just had a, a relatively recent book out called How Learning Happens with Carl Hendrick. And that's just a fantastic, fantastic book. So well put together, so well written and so rich. And to have everything in, you know, in one place is, is, is wonderful. So that's a great resource. And obviously, you know, some of his work, um, I guess one of the most well-known papers was the one with kind of Sweller and Clark about why minimal guidance during instruction doesn't work. That's a really, really good paper to get your head into. Um, and then I guess um, a couple more uh, would be, so Dylan William, who's a pretty well-known British um, educationalist. Um, he's probably more well-known for maybe um, schools kind of side of things, but he's got some really great things to say um, around education and, uh, and then, and then Donald Clark, I think as well, I know he's been, uh, you know, someone that you've, you've spoken to on here as well. He's, uh, really kind of fantastic in terms of how evidence based he is and his writings great. Um, so he's been, um, very important in terms of someone that I've kind of, um, learned from through his, through his writing in particular. Um, and I suppose, you know, the one slight left field one for me isn't really a kind of learning person, but it's someone that I'm, uh, I, I get a lot from, and it's a, it's a German industrial designer called Dieter Rams. Um, and I don't know how well known he is, but he's, um, he was uh, famous uh, for his work with Braun. Um, and he wrote uh, 10 principles of, of good design. And I really like those principles and like what he has to say. You know, one of those principles is about design being really thorough down to the last detail. Um, one of those things about design being long lasting. There's some really good principles there, I think. And he's, um, he's got some really good messages that I think are applicable to our times, even though he's not someone I'd say, you know, for learning, go to this guy because he's an industrial designer. It's a very different kind of field. But I think I have learned from other design fields in my time and I, I, I dip into them to just kind of uh, grow my knowledge and broaden things a little bit. Well, thank you for sharing that. Let me switch gears here a little bit. Uh, I'm going to ask you, you know, what's your 30 second elevator speech? And I normally set this up by saying you're at a neighborhood party. There's a, somebody new in the neighborhood. They don't know you. And they ask you, Neil, what do you do? What is your response to them? Yeah. So this is a, this is something that me and my wife joke about quite a lot because my wife is a graphic designer. So when we do go to a neighborhood party and people ask us what we do, uh, she will say I'm a graphic designer and everyone will go that's really really cool Neil what do you do and usually my 30 second elevator pitch isn't as good as hopefully it's going to be right now um, but I, I guess I would say uh, I, I, I kind of help people design the best conditions for learning to result and, and that might be through uh, you know formal courses or it might be just through uh, looking at things organizationally or people development Hopefully that was okay. It's not as good as graphic. It will, it will never be graphic designer or. Yeah, or everybody understands that. There's a, it's, there's a long history of most people don't understand what we in this particular field do. They can't imagine how we can, you know, teach or train people in jobs that we ourselves don't have or cover topic areas that we're not experts in. And, and uh, it's kind of funny. That's kind of why I asked the question, but uh, it, it, but anyway, let me let me shift gears again here. Um, so as a lifelong learner, uh, can you share with us what your current focus or next focus is for your own learning? Yeah, you know what, Guy, I mean, at the moment, I feel a little bit, I was saying to someone today that I feel a little bit like my head's exploding in terms of all of these things that I've uh, are popping into my head. I want to learn about this. I want to learn about that. I feel like I'm really going through a period at the moment where um, you know, that's the case. Um, I guess, um, you know, AI is a big one for me. Um, it's something that um, I feel like I need to know much more about and delve more deeply into, and I, and I haven't. Um, I remember someone saying on something that I listened to um, recently that was saying, you know, when higher education comes out of this, AI is going to whack it over the head or words to that effect. And, was, I, and I don't know whether I totally agree with that, but uh, it kind of certainly spurred me to think, actually, um, I need to invest some more time into looking into this. Um, and I guess, 
Another big thing on my mind, I suppose, is, is, is a kind of digital transformation. And obviously there's a, there's a learning aspect to that and there's more of a kind of an organizational aspect to that. There's actually a whole bunch of different aspects to that in terms of change. So um, really thinking about, uh, about that uh, carefully and all of the different dimensions of that, because in big organizations that can be incredibly complex. So there's different things that I, I pick out of that, I suppose. Um, yeah, and so I think those are probably the main things. I mean, I still feel like, um, you know, I, there's so much uh, more research and, uh, you know, real great influences from the past that I want to kind of delve into. Um, and I just want to make sure I get through the books and not just have lots of books, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Are you doing any writing of your own uh, articles or blog posts or what can you share with us about that? Yeah, I really love writing um, and uh, I guess probably like everyone, um, it can sometimes be a challenge to carve that out. Um, so I blog relatively regularly and not as regularly as I like. Um, I think the last piece I, I wrote was in the Times Higher Education, which was talking about a little bit of a debate around how uh, universities are resourced for supporting learning and teaching. So um, I try to write as much as I can, mainly through my blog, but I also do through other publications. Um, but I'm a little bit more uh, irregular than I'd like at the moment. So I don't have anything particularly planned, but uh, writing's, a, writing's a weird thing for me. Sometimes it can take me sort of 10 minutes to you know, get a couple of words and sometimes it just flows out. So when it flows out, I try to kind of jump on that and get something out on the blog. Very cool, thank you. Um, let's delve back a little bit into some of the uh, uh, people who have uh, had a great influence on you. And this is kind of your chance to do a little shout out. It may be people that nobody else has ever heard of, or you, you've mentioned several people already, but uh, is there anybody else that you would add uh, that you think, you know, our audience might want to follow them because they've had some influence impact uh, in your thinking and your practices? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So I was thinking, yeah, I was thinking about this and I think, I think there's probably three people that come to mind. So um, someone um, from the UK, so Leonard Hoax, who's um, an instructional designer uh, in London. And he is just uh, a really fantastic guy, someone I, I know and speak to. Um, he is again, a really strong evidence informed uh, practitioner you know, very well read and uh, he's been a really helpful person for me. Uh, you know, it, it really kind of sharpened me and, and it's been great to kind of discuss a whole range of different things and share things. And he's on Twitter and he's a great guy to follow. He's written pretty widely as well on a bunch of publications. So he's a really, really good one um, <clears throat> for people to follow, I think. Um, the other one um, is someone called Greg Ashman, who's not someone I know uh, personally, uh, but he's a, an Australian uh, working in the school sector. And I think what I like about him is that um, he's kind of, uh, he's quite bold in challenging different ideologies and different influences on education more generally. Um, you know, he's also kind of very good in terms of learning and evidence informed practices, but he's also kind of looking at the bigger picture and the kinds of influences from outside education um, that might have a negative impact on education. So he's, he's a really thoughtful um, person. And again, you know, all of these people are online. Uh, I think the, and then I think the last one again is, is Stephanie Moore, who I know you've, you've spoken to as well. Um, you know, she's just someone, again, not someone I know personally, but someone that I just find fantastic following her on Twitter um, always makes me think around the use of technology and online learning, uh, very experienced, very, very knowledgeable. Um, so, you know, when it comes to thinking about who I'd recommend to follow those three um, feature pretty, pretty highly on my list. Yes, thank you very much for sharing that. Uh, Neil, thanks for doing this interview with me. And I have one last question for you. And it's, 
Can you share any parting words of wisdom or guidance for our audience, especially people that are kind of new to the field, but, but what would you suggest to somebody who's just entering into this world? Um, you know, what, what's your guidance for them? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's coming back to the evidence informed um, approach because, you know, what, what's happening at the moment is, you know, great uncertainty, isn't it? Lots of debate about what the future's like for learning, what's the model going to look like? And, you know, I guess that can be a bit confusing if you're going to come in new to this, to this world. And, you know, whatever the end result, you know, wherever we're kind of headed, if you, you know, invest and delve into the evidence behind learning, learning sciences, you have just a really fantastic platform and a foundation for whatever comes your way, you know, whether it's, um, you know, different types of models, whether it's fully online or blended or, or, or in the classroom, whether you're working for a university or a college or a school or a training provider, you know, you have that foundation that's going to get you through, particularly in certain in uncertain times at the moment, but also that's going to benefit you if you want to move across into working with a whole range of different education providers, you're going to have that basis and that foundation. So, you know, really delving into the research and the evidence around learning um, is just so important. I agree. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing everything that you do on social media. I, I'm, I'm very intrigued and I love following your work. And uh, thank you for sharing with us today. Cheers. Thanks, Guy. Thank you.